The scientific revolution starts now. When I, I was trying to find stuff on the old copper culture, that's how I found out about you. And it was like okay. the only video that was decent. I mean, there might have there might have been a couple. There was a couple of primary academic lectures or something, but in terms yeah. of just a good overview of the situation and the. There's I not even one it. about the Minoans coming over to take the copper, which I would expect would certainly be somewhere <laughs> on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they're probably there. They're just further down in the search results, I'm sure. <laughs> but. Yeah, it was that, yeah, it's actually funny, the lectures you mentioned. I'm pretty sure I've watched all those lectures because when I did the Copper Culture video, I originally just wanted to do this survey of archaic, like, eastern woodlands. And I stumbled on the Copper Culture, and I was like, well, I want to learn a little bit more about this because I think, like, if I mention this, I have to go into some detail about it because people are going to want to know more. And I think I, like, stumbled on one of those lectures, and I was just like, oh, holy cow, this is the episode. Like, this is all I'm going to talk about. Like, this is so fascinating. And then, um, and I think even in one of the lectures, like one of them recommended like a couple books and I ended up like getting those, reading them and it just took off from there. Yeah. The old copper culture is really startling because you don't think of North America as being, well, as using metals as much, I suppose in general, but it turns out that's not really the case. They just weren't smelting metals, right? That seems yeah, to be the distinction. Yeah. It doesn't fit. It like doesn't fit our conception of like, a culture with metal working, you know, like we, I think have a very specific picture in our head and native Americans, at least native Americans in like, you know, North America just don't really fit that conception. You know, if you have metal, you know, you have to have swords, you have to have knives, you have to have like, you know, you know, metal implements, metal wheels and stuff. And, you know, those people just never had it. They didn't really need any of those. Yeah, what were they doing with the metal? Um, making just about every kind of uh, tool that you know they needed that they had in their tool set. You can find like you can find like metal um, spear points. You can find metal knives. You can find like metal. You can find like metal awls. Um, you can find uh, like metal like scrapers and stuff. Um, and then apart from that you find like a lot of just like decorative metal objects like effigies that are like made out of copper and stuff or like ear spools that are made out of copper jewelry that's made out of copper. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because, well, I mean, you've seen the video, but like copper tools kind of start to fade out of the picture, but like those other copper materials, like they stick around, like they become more and more prevalent. Inter the other ones meaning the ornamental stuff? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so there's a transition from functional tools to just baubles, basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so I well. would say, I would say copper, I would say people just start looking at copper. They're like, not as like a tool material, but instead as like a prestige item. You know what I mean? This is like what, you know, this is like the material you would use to make something like really beautiful with. Mm -hmm. Can you put a date on when all this mining was going on, like a range? So if if I recall, I think that there's been some evidence that suggests it starts as early as like 8000 years ago or 8000 BCE. I don't wow. remember strictly off the top of my head, which is super early. And then that and then I mean, copper working continues all the way up until like contact and even after. But, like, the copper culture, those tools, those only go through, like, the archaic, through, like, the middle archaic, and then they kind of, like, stop using copper tools at that. They just, you just, they start replacing them with stone tools. And mm -hmm. there's been some interesting research as to, like, why you would switch from copper to, like, stone. Um, there's a, uh, there's a professor, I'm trying to remember, M yeah, Michelle Beber who did her graduate thesis on that. And I read the whole thesis. It was, it's a, it was a really good read, but she basically like, um, took, took copper, remade a lot of those tools and just kind of like 
did a lot of experiments to measure like how durable they were, how sharp they stayed. And she, her research led her to believe that like the time it makes, it takes to like make a copper tool is not very like economically viable if you have a good source of stone, which is interesting because in the upper peninsula of Michigan, there aren't many good stone sources there. Like copper was just what they had. So that's what they used. And, well, and, and it, copper is probably pretty flimsy, right? By itself. Like it's probably not as good as stone in some sense. Cause it's not like they were uh, tempering it with other metals, right? They were just yeah. pulling mm -hmm. it out of the ground essentially. Yeah. They're just, yeah, they're just taking it and they're just annealing the copper. Mm -hmm. Which and, is, go ahead. I was just going to say, so if they switch off of copper because they find that other stone tools are better, but there's not a good source of stone on the peninsula, does that mean that they're getting stone from somebody else? Yep. They're trading for it. Mm -hmm. And so is that, is 8,000 8, years ago is when they start making the implements and they stop making them about 1,000 BC. Is that right? Uh, I'm looking at the I Wikipedia to... article and it says okay, artifacts. Yeah. I was about to say, I would need to double check. I don't remember off the top of my head. Like if we're working off of, let's say, off of Wikipedia. And so it says that artifacts have been dated from 7,500 to 1,000. And so okay. does that mean that trading just picked up around 1,000 or the switch from tools to other artifacts happened earlier in that process? I mean, it could, I mean, I'm sure people were trading before that 1,000 date. I mean, there's a lot of good evidence to show that like there were trade networks, things, materials were moving around for some reason at that point. I mean, maybe there's just like enough maybe there's like a sure enough supply of stone tools to kind of displace using copper. Mm -hmm. And so then that's kind of when the switch gets made or maybe, you know, people just liked stone tools better. You know what I mean? Maybe they got sick of annealing and they were just like, Hey, you know what? You can just like nap, like, you know, a point or a knife or something. It kind of like speaks to a certain level of economic development, right? Because I think that the way that economic theory operates is that, okay, if you start to make something and you make it for yourself locally because you're the only one who can make it, then you'll put however much time and effort you need to put into it because it's you need the tool and this is the best that you're going to do. But mm -hmm. as soon as you have a market where it's like somebody who's down the road is making these incredible stone knives, there's no mm -hmm. point for you to make the, the copper tools because you can change them into bobbles, the bobbles will be worth more on the market and you can mm -hmm. get the stone stuff for less effort than yeah. it took to make mm -hmm. the jewelry. And that yeah. speaks and to you... sophistication that like, mm -hmm. I think, I guess I just don't associate instinctively with. And actually I don't think North the America. like indigenous culture. And I don't think that, I don't think the copper culture, like the people of the copper culture or at least their descendants, I don't even think that they were crafting the copper themselves, I think they were just exporting the copper, mm. like, you know, down the rivers, down the lakes, and then other people were getting the copper and then fashioning it into, you know, like into their things. So like, if you look at, you know, like, like Mississippian art, for example, like the copper artifacts you find there, like, you know, they were made by Mississippians. It's the same art that you see. It's the same like style of art that you'll see on like, you know, their pottery in, you know, their, um, in their pottery and their decoration and stuff. So it at least would make the most sense to me that they're the ones who are doing that. They're just getting sent copper from, uh, from the great lakes or from, there's actually one other source in the Appalachian somewhere that you can also get native copper from. So you can all, so you can get it from there. It's just not as plentiful as it is up in the uh, upper peninsula. Right on. What's really interesting is that, the pre-Incan societies and civilizations seem to have developed the smelting process. Mm -hmm. I think this was as early as like two and a half thousand years ago. Yeah, but I want to say, because I know that by, by the time Chavin's there, they, there's like metalworking. They, you can find like gold artifacts from that culture. I don't specifically know how far back it goes. I know that the, er I remember reading at some point the earliest gold objects in south america are basically like these like gold sheets that were flattened they were just pounded out and flattened and then rolled 
and strung like into a like into a necklace. Mm. Mm. Mm-hmm. But I forget. I know they were making alloys by the by the time of the very early civilization at Lake Titicaca, like right at the bottom. I forget mm-hmm. the name of the civilization. Tiwanaku. Probably, what is it? Is it Tiwanaku? The Tiwanaku. Yeah, because they had yeah. these really interesting bronze clamps that were joining their yeah. their mason blocks. Mm-hmm. Which I, I found that really interesting, just because you know why do you have that discovery in the south but not in the north it's it's very strange do you think that it just wasn't the there was something about the culture of the north versus the culture of the south or that um, lent itself to that kind of you know you, you, so, those kind of tools and materials i think it's i think it has a lot i think it has more to do with the source because you know in north america like by the great lakes the copper they're getting is native copper it's almost completely pure right when it comes out of the ground you know people in south america once they kind of figured out you know you know what metal was how to work it they must have realized that you know that there were ores that had that metal in it and they had to separate the ore from the metal if they wanted to work it so they basically had a problem that they had to solve and that problem never existed in the Great Lakes. Mm. I mean, you know, like, you know, the copper culture got spoiled. Like, they had mm-hmm. the best copper in abundance that, they, that you could ever want. If the roles were reversed, I think you would have seen the, you know, the opposite. You would have seen, you know, like, smelting and more sophisticated metallurgy take off in North America. And then, you know, everybody in South America would just be, you know, annealing copper. Do you think that that led to the rise of the more megalithic architecture and so forth in the South, like the bigger civilizations with armies and, you know? Um, that's, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, is, intuitively, I get... it seems like it would be connected because if you have better weapons. Or better saws. And like the organization that's required to maintain knowledge and improve it and kind of iterate upon it. That just seems like a really industrialized type of the, state. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. The question that like I'm turning in my head is just like, what can you do with metal that you can't re you know, that you can't do with stone or other materials. And I feel weird like saying this, but like, I can't think of a lot because, you know, like take Tiwanaku. I mean, you know, most stuff like the stone cutting that they were doing and everything you know, is, is probably with stone tools, it probably wasn't with copper tools because they just would not be very good for, um, you know, for quarrying that stone. You're just better off using stone tools for that. Um, so maybe then it's the, that you need a state to have the infrastructure to actually do all that industrial manufacturing. So it's more mm-hmm. of a symptom than a cause or something like yeah. that. Like you need to organize lots of people with different materials and forge them in some dedicated process that you've iterated on maybe that requires a state something more approximating a state something more metropolitan yeah because i imagine i imagine that it must be born like one of the original questions that we had when we found you was we were we were finding all these references to the development of metallurgy in cultures Mm -hmm. and we were like what is happening that causes them to invent this because it's see it's not a it's not a it's not like digging raw copper out of the ground and hammering it it usually mm-hmm. gets like one line in the Wikipedia article. It's like, and then they develop metallurgy. And you're just like, really? Like, that was just one afternoon? Like, they must have, you know, because you look at industrial manufacture, let's just say metals today, right? It's mm-hmm. this basically huge uh, technical I don't science. know how they make metals. If, if at civilization ended tomorrow, I would not be able to recreate metals. I would <laughs> I mean, be the one digging them out of the right? ground. But it's this very, very technical iteration and trying out different doping agents and different you know i don't i don't know they have to temper it heat it cool it it's just this very uh cookbook type science it seems like that would require a state in order to keep it organized maybe it's hard to imagine a guy just on his farm developing that by himself or with his buddies but maybe i mean as long as you have some sort of network where you know okay somebody knows you know where to find like these metals, these ores, and somebody else knows, you know, how to, you know, how to like smelt it, how to refine it. And then somebody else knows how to like cast it. I mean, that's really what matters. 
I that's like half a city need, block right there. Need, I don't know if you need like a state to make that happen, but I, in fact, I don't think you would. But but yeah, basically, you need you need those networks to exist, and then obviously, at some point, somebody has to kind of realize, like, oh wait a second, if we can like melt this down and like melt this down into a metal, what would happen if we combined it with like other materials, other metals and create alloys? You know, people, I think one, you know, there comes a point where people are going to realize that this is something that like they can experiment with and they can like refine that knowledge and practice more and more. Don't you think the state crop like pops up to defend those trade agreements? I think that what like the, the partially the trade agreements, but also partially it's a method of providing time. Cause you said something really interesting earlier, Pete, where you were like, mm-hmm. I can't think of anything that metal would do that stone couldn't do just as well. And well, so not you, just as well, but couldn't do. Couldn't do. Okay. Yeah. So you basically, yeah. you have somebody who has to go around and be like, yeah, we have got to increase the efficiency of what we're doing. And that just seems like a really bureaucratic thing. It really seems like somebody who's like, look, we have a communal goal. We have to cut these blocks and it's not moving fast enough. And we, we're going to need better tools. And then, you know, the like the pencil pushing nerds of the ancient world well, get on in it. That line's, <laughs> everybody in that line's livelihood depends on you having a really good relationship with the people who are mining the raw materials on the other end of the, mm-hmm. or, you know, the other end of the continent. Yeah. Or whatever, so. And so then you all of a sudden have to protect your trade routes and your like political engagements because if those people mm-hmm. get pissed at you they won't sell the copper anymore or the tin or the lead or the whatever yeah. yeah well and if you have like you know if you're a ancient state and like there's metal being produced in you know your land your area that's something that you want to control the access to you know you probably don't want that leaving you know your country your state or whatever you don't want your rivals getting a hold of that because you know at some point it's a strategic resource you know you don't want other people getting into that you want to be able to control that and that seems really an old impulse because i think the chimps are the same way they're like this is our space and this is our fruit and this is our forest and you're going to stay out of it and so it just seems like humans are distinguished by being really good at maintaining those boundaries and progressively developing technologies that ensure the the maintenance of this kind of chimp brained thing of like there's not enough to go around we could, mm. because if you hear about the birth of civilization you often hear about the birth of agriculture and so forth but you don't think a lot about these sort of economic arrangements that must have gone into the birth of the first states as well i mean it was a pretty seriously developed state from what i understand that pre-incan civilization was, Kiwanaku? Yeah. Was that the mm. early what was that um, what was the earliest civilization in the Americas? The, so with a state. The earliest it? so the earliest um I guess what we'd call civilization, even though that term is slowly getting packed and packed with more baggage as time goes on. But like, the earliest state like, ur- like, like institutional urban civilization, state. I think is like what you're thinking of. And um with like the a government earliest, and a and a, a class of gods, like monumental and, architecture and sure, everything, yeah. trade routes. Yeah, what you're probably thinking of is um, Corral, or sometimes it's called Norte Chico civilization. That happens on the coast of central Peru in um, uh, about like th- like three thousand thirty five hundred years ago, or I'm sorry, not years ago, BC. Mm-hmm. So. That's where you first start seeing like cities, pyramids, you know, like, you know, cities, pyramids, you start seeing like trade routes come in and everything. There's a lot of evidence at that site to suggest that like there is some sort of state and government. There's somebody who's like organizing all this like pyramid construction and everything. And I mean, those pyramids are as old as like the pyramids in Egypt. Like they were built Mm -hmm. at the same time. So. Um, so yeah, like somebody has to be like managing all that labor and everything. So it suggests that there is some sort of, um, like some sort of political arrangement or some sort of political control happening there. Although, you know, you would probably find people that would argue the opposite and that this is just people coming together and building this because they like to build it or because there's a lot of value in bringing a lot of people together and doing something. You see similar arguments made like like those kind of arguments you tend to see a lot like with mound building in the eastern woodlands. 
There's not, oh, you know, like nobody's in one area farming the land, but they're, but these mounds are coming up. So the thought is, oh, well, people are coming in here. They're taking part of in this community enterprise and building these mounds and just coming back like every so often to like add to them. It's that's a kind of the standard so. nori. Uh, that's kind of the standard narrative for uh, the Turkish ancient civilizations. We just had a podcast talking about Gobekli. Go, I can't always go Gobekli go 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 Tepe. tepe. Yeah, and mm-hmm. Chateau Hoyek. And mm-hmm. it seems like these tepes were also like the pro- the popular idea is that they're places people visited on pilgrimages because there doesn't mm-hmm. seem to have been a lot of settlements, you know, and a lot of resources really, like forest or anything. But I. I wonder what, how good our understanding of the changes to the environment is. Like, we live in the Pacific Northwest, and the Pacific Northwest Mm -hmm. has the Missoula floods. And Mm -hmm. so you can go up to northeastern Washington, and you can see the channeled scablins. You can go up to Missoula, Montana. You can see where Mm -hmm. this glacial lake was forming. You can see the way that the water has carved the landscape. Mm -hmm. But this is, you know... I think they would call it like a five sigma event. This is like an incredibly rare level of this amount of water on the landscape. And even with this size of event, it was hard for people to come around to seeing it as having shaped the landscape. Mm. Right? Like back around the time when the first person... Are you saying that Peru is very different? Well, Peru is really seismic. And like the the Mm. Andes are constantly changing. And I'm like, Mm -hmm. how much has changed in the Andes in 8,000 years or is it uh, 5,000 years? Mm. What's the standard narrative for why that location was chosen? Do people have a good sense of, a theoretical sense of why the first civilization appeared there? In Karal? Yeah. Yeah. It's actually, so it's, so it's in a river valley and it's not far from the coast. And in the archaeology there, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of like seafood. There's a lot of like fish remains and everything. So um, and there's also like some agriculture that's happening there as well. So where people are getting most of their nutrients, it looks like it's coming from the sea. There's actually a name for this hypothesis. It's called and I might butcher the name here, but it's called basically the like maritime foundation or no the andean maritime foundation hypothesis that basically says you know civilization kickstarts in peru not necessarily because agriculture is taking off but because people are getting better and better at harnessing like you know the the bounty of the coastline and like the fish the mollusks and all the resources there but there's a really interesting thing, which is like, if there's a volcanic eruption there, I feel like at this distance, it would be really hard to see the signs of the volcanic eruption on the landscape enough to be able to say if something got buried. Because you said something really interesting that it seemed like a site where people gathered, but people didn't live. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, how certain are we that that's the case? Because that's the same thing with Gobekli Tepe, where they're like, well, there's no sign of people living here. But I'm like, well... What if the landscape was really different? Like the, it's it's at the top of this plain called the Heron Plain. Yeah, and it seems plausible that that had water on it at some point. I mean that. I mean that gets into like climates. That gets into like climate studies. That's not my area of expertise. I mean, you can like you know you can take soil cores. You can like look at like pollen and like seeds and stuff that are like down in the soil. I mean, really, what it comes down to is just it's it's how you know, how far you're willing to dig down to recover that, you know, geological history and everything. Um, Obviously, you know, like, obviously, if you're excavating somewhere and you think like, okay, we've reached this cultural level. This is the oldest culture in the area. You might not dig any deeper, even though further below, there might be older cultures, you know, Mm. like you can have, bias come in and affect that yeah definitely i think that that's kind of what i'm I'm thinking of is just that with archaeology i feel like we construct the story from the details that we've found but we always operate within the context of all of these missing parameters that would inform Mm -hmm. the like the arc and dynamics of the evolution of the culture like Mm -hmm. how how special was that location were there other civilization-ish places popping up around the same time in the Americas? Like, 
when do we see uh the real mesoamerican boom or like the olmec or or the Cahok- maybe Cahokia is even later so so um so in mesoamerica the olmec they kind of start taking off like just before like 2000 bc if i'm like remembering the dates correctly and in some ways you could kind of say that they're late but when they hit the scene like mesoamerican culture really just explodes like at that moment it just takes off the americas it's kind of like north america it's kind of harder to say because again like it kind of it you know it depends on what your criteria is for a civilization like again if you're looking at like you know, cities, agriculture, that whole thing, then it's probably not until about like, it's probably not until like the late woodland period that that stuff really takes off. Cause Cahokia gets started right at about like, right at about like, uh, 1000 to 1050, um, AD. And then it kind mm-hmm. of blossoms in the following century. Yeah. But at the same time, I mean, people thousands of years earlier in North America, are building huge, like, you know, huge monuments, these really incredible, like, earthworks that have, like, all this incredible mathematic precision. But again, like, there's, you know, they're not living there permanently. Nobody's practicing agriculture. They can still have these huge, like, trade routes that go thousands of miles in either direction. But, you know, again, because they're not sedentary and living in just one spot and practicing agriculture, a lot of people might just think, well, that's not a civilization, but, you know, they're still doing a lot of incredible things there. It seems like you only really need that wide-scale agriculture if you're trying to keep an army going or to keep people fed who are working in the furnaces or the mines or to really have these the scale of society. Yeah, when you need to have people in one spot. And is there a sense that that spread from the south northward or was it independently discovered at each of these? Because, I mean, there's a nice timeline there, at least, it seems like, in terms of it moving to northward. So, go on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify. So, the, the northward movement would be starting from Corral and then going, what would be the path? Yeah, just where this, where, we don't have to call it civilization, but the formal state that's fielding an army and then feeding that army with, and protecting its resources and so forth. It's moving more towards the Olmecs, I guess, would be the next ones. So, again, um, it kind of depends on the criteria you're using. There is actually one important development, I think, not from South America to Mesoamerica, but definitely from Mesoamerica to North America, that you can trace, and that's the introduction of corn. Mm. So, like... You know, the Olmec are, you know, they're farming corn. Um, That's kind of like what their agricultural base is. And corn had already been, you know, farmed in Mesoamerica for, you know, for thousands of years before that. Did the Peruvians mess with corn at all? They did, but corn was originally domesticated in um, Mesoamerica. And it goes south, Hmm. like into South America. It gets picked up there. And then there's actually some recent evidence that like it kind of gets further domesticated in South America. And then some of those new varieties come back Mm. into Mexico Mm. and then, you know, they kind of get picked up there. And then uh, I think it's like 4,000 years ago or about like, yeah, 4,000 years ago or so, or maybe it's 4,000 BC. I'm not sure, but it goes into North America much later. It goes first into the Southwest and then at around like, you know, I would say um, around like, you know, 700 to a thousand AD or so it goes like East into like the Eastern woodlands. And then it's picked up by people like the Mississippians. It starts getting grown at Cahokia. And when you see like corn introduced, like it really changes things there Hmm. because it suddenly becomes possible to support large populations with agriculture. And those populations can be sedentary for much longer. 
Are you watching the Demystify Sci podcast and wondering what can I do to support this absolutely incredible project? Well, wonder no more because you can come on over to patreon.com slash demystify sci and sign up to give us a couple dollars a month. Might not be a lot for you, but all of those donations add up and they let us push this project to even greater heights. So yeah, do they, and do they specialize at that point? I mean, do you see specialization of labor with the introduction of agriculture? Do you see people fielding armies? Like, what? What is all of what? What's happening? You're saying they're sedentary, but because it seems like this is a transition that's relatively recent, and so is a decent mm-hmm. example of you. You, you know, if, if you can make some general rule about what happens when you have a hunter gatherer population that suddenly gets access to something that lets them stay in one place? Like, what happens so, afterwards to the cultures? So, it's kind of interesting, because if you look at the Southwest, um, when corn initially enters the Southwest, it doesn't make a big impact. The people that are living in the American Southwest, you know, they'll, like, have it, they might, like, consume it here or there, but they're not really, you know, they're not doing a whole lot with it. It's not until, a f- it's not until like, you know, like a thousand or 2000 years later when corn gets better adapted to like, um, to like the conditions of the Southwest, it can be more drought resistance that it really takes off. And I don't know a hundred percent if this is true, but I suspect that it also has something to do with just what the carrying capacity of the landscape is. If you can make, you know, a good living, um, you know, just, you know, hunting and just foraging like around you you're probably going to do that because like agriculture that's a lot of work it's when that stops being easy and viable that you're going to pick up agriculture that you're going to decide okay we're going to you know we're going to stay here we're going to plant crops we're going to work those the whole year round and gather a harvest it requires Um, almost some organization and uh, i don't want to say slavery but you know some it seems like even in ancient inca that the state, in some sense, there's a word for this. I think it's like mitya or mitya. Or, mitya. What is it? mitya? Yeah. Mm. So there, is, there's some system? there's some idea that that people volunteer to work as part of the shared infrastructure, whether it's the yeah. army or working in the fields mm. for some portion of time. Right? It's like the civil service or something. Yeah, yeah. So they it still would, have some remnant of that down there, from what I understand. Yeah, it would be like it'd be like like community or like corvée labor. So basically, if you were living in this time you would be obligated to spend and i don't know what the time period is but let's just say like a month away from your home you know working on some project for the state could be like a local project maybe you're like you know digging a canal or something maybe you're building a road or maybe you're getting conscripted into the army or something and so you know you'll do that for so much time and then once it's over you know you go home you go back to your farm or whatever and then you know like the next mita like comes around like the next year then you'll you know get picked back up and put back into like you know like the army or like some project or something yeah it makes sense that you would need the meat you would need something like that in order to get people to actually contribute because the benefit of agriculture is that you're able to store some of that as well right yeah Mm -hmm. So you have this reserve, the concept of the reserve, like economics Mm -hmm. in full starts to make sense along with the birth of the state. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I feel like that might be a decent definition for civilization, right? It doesn't have all of the baggage that comes with it. It's literally cultures that begin to organize for the production of things that are not necessary for immediate survival, but become... Mm -hmm ceremonially and culturally valuable it's this idea of creating a mass culture that Mm -hmm. almost seems like that's what civilization is where you can have a situation where people are just coming to this one site and they're gathering from all different places but that doesn't mean that they're not connected in this civilizational structure of central value where this site is somehow important despite all of their background differences Is yeah, there, that is an interesting definition. Yeah, like, is there a way that people, like, what do people say if they can't say civilization anymore? Culture is typically what they'll say. Mm-hmm. Interesting. That seems like it erases the, just the sheer. Yeah, like the achievements and the complexity of it. 
And mm. I just think it's I, not the, it's not quite the right word because we can have col- all sorts of cultures, but we don't have states, right? Like, like I feel like yeah. birds have culture, but like yeah. I wouldn't say that birds have every states. every human has culture. Like no matter, yeah, like where you live or what you do, like you know, humans always live together. They're always going to have like you know a culture within their own group. Right, but you're not necessarily enforcing contracts and fielding armies and providing for next year's supplies and things like that. Something long range about the idea of civilization. It just feels like the minute that you start to take on projects that are focused on some like unrealized time. Yeah, like, you know, I don't know if you've seen, but people are trying to build these clocks. I think Jeff Bezos is building a clock that he wants to last a thousand years. Like a mechanical clock that he wants to just keep ticking for a thousand years. Yeah, literally. So it's in the huh. it's in the desert. It's I, I I don't remember. I think it's like the Millennium Project. Let's see, Jeff Bezos clock, the ten thousand year clock, That's and it's inside of a mountain too. in West Texas, and they're like actively uh, they're actively building it. They had to like figure out specific ways to design the metallurgy for the clock so that the metal doesn't fuse together into a dysfunctional mechanism over the course of a thousand mm-hmm. years. And I'm like, I don't want to call Jeff Bezos' ideas the uh, high watermark of civilization, but I feel like somebody who's like, we're going to make something for 10,000 years from now embodies the spirit. <laughs> <laughs> the future archaeologists will undoubtedly think so. Yeah. Right? And so it's like all this these... This Yeah, like, do you have a sense of there being... A push for legacy in these cultures where they wanted to leave something for the f- the future? Is that even possible to read off the archaeological um, record? I mean, sometimes it is. I mean, I think that's a pretty, like, human instinct to just to leave a legacy. I think that that's something that, you know, that all humans want, whether it's through, like, you know, their family, their kids, or you know, something that they give to the next generation. I think that all humans have that to an extent. Um, Obviously, like, in places like, you know, Mesoamerica, you can see, like, you know, kings erecting these giant, you know, huge monuments. They have these long inscriptions that tell you, you know, who made that monument, what they did, why they were important. Um, In that case, it's very clear cut. For other cultures that may not have had writing it's hard to know what the logic behind a certain monument is if legacy was like the like if it was the you know the thing that was on the front of their minds so that's a good question but like i honestly don't know you might you know you might construct something because maybe you believe that there's like an immediate good that's going to come of that you know what i mean you're not really thinking like oh man you know like 500 years from now people are gonna like see this and they're gonna know how awesome we were you know maybe there's more immediate benefit to it that we just aren't aware of you know it's hard to it's hard to say that for sure i mean you can speculate i think about it but yeah it's hard to conclusively say whether or not that's the case unless it's written on there so, do you have you thought much about the peopling of the Americas the, before any of these civilizations showed up? The story because uh, there, there's s- an interesting parallel between the peopling and the ideas, like the the birth of all of these civil civilized ideas, right? <laughs> but you know that leads to an interesting question of what kind of uh, diffusion was going on around the world at that time too. Yeah, because there's two ways that it could go. It could go that there is a peopling and then a diffusion of culture, mm-hmm. or it could mm-hmm. be that the peopling and the culture comes at the same time. Right, right. And so, so I wonder, yeah. So I actually think that this is just my opinion, but I actually think that there is some um, some evidence for that because there are similarities between Native Americans and, you know, people in Siberia and East Asia. Like, one thing that you see across a lot of Native American cultures, like, you know, North America, South America, Mesoamerica, is that primary directions are associated with colors. 
So you might have like, you know, south is like black, east is yellow, rest is red or, you know, something like that. And people, as I understand it, there are people in Asia that have that exact same understanding that primary colors can be matched to cardinal directions. And it's interesting that like, you know, that that pops up in those two areas because, you know, we know from, you know, like, you know, genetic studies and everything that Native Americans, you know, their ancestry comes from East Asia and that they, you know, came over to America, you know, uh, after the last I or I guess now with the current archaeological evidence sometime during the uh, last glacial maximum, the last big freeze, so to speak. If that makes sense that they could have brought ideas with them. Mm-hmm. What are what is the odds that they could have gotten ideas through contact with peoples without actually being peopled by those peoples? If that makes sense. <laughs> well, so one of the re- so there's many different proposed peoplings, right? So the Bering Land mm-hmm. Bridge is, I think, the favorite one. But then, I mean, I uh, I can't help but notice that Kerala is directly parallel to like Papua New Guinea. It's like directly across the ocean. And so you can imagine mm-hmm. that if somebody was able to set sail and go across the ocean, that the place where they would have landed would have been right around Kerala. And so, and but that's a really unpopular... evidence, right? Yeah, so there's, there's later so, genetic evidence for their mm-hmm. overlap, but not earlier. And so I'm like, how can we be sure that there wasn't an earlier connection? I, yeah, I don't, I don't so, know what the evidence is. So it's actually funny that you mentioned it because I just finished a book on this topic it's Fantastic. called origins by jennifer raff she's a geneticist out at um uh university of kansas i believe and it's in for one thing it's really interesting because most people who write about the people in the americans americas are not geneticists they typically are archaeologists so they'll kind of cry they'll kind of put that information first and foremost but she looks at it from the perspective of a geneticist and um so currently like the main body of evidence you know like i said shows people kind of like coming out of asia between like you know between like you know 25 15,000 years ago or something but it's interesting because in the past few years there have been some interesting discoveries that show that there were like different populations that had moved into America, into the Americas at some time. Um, In 2016, there was a genetic study done on, you know, different on people in the Amazon, indigenous groups in the Amazon. And, you know, they had that same genetic heritage that most other native, that like native Americans have that show that Asian connection, but they also have genes from this, population that they call population y Mm. and what's interesting about population y is that there are um they share they share genes that are also found in australasian peoples today okay now the way that like those genes are like dispersed and like the patterns of them in the population they don't suggest that like you know that somebody, you know, sailed over recently from like Polynesia and like colonized um, the Americas. It's much older than that. So it's believed that at some point, like a separate population that had like broken off from like that Austronesian population came through, you know, like came through Beringia, came into the Americas and settled there. What's interesting is that the timing isn't known. And this is very, very speculative. But it's possible that that population, population Y, could have gotten into the Americas before the ice caps shut and then melted and opened again and let, you know, other people in or allowed people to come down the coast. I would say that's the more popular theory now, um, given that there were obviously people in the Americas before the glaciers reopened. Um, so why did they think that those Australasian groups didn't sail? Why do they think they took the Beringia route? Um, because archaeo. So, from what I read, they basically said that the way that the patterns, the way that the pattern is in South America, you find 
most of these genes like in the Amazon. They're not on the West Coast. Hmm. If these people did come over the sea or something, like you would expect the population to be much bigger there. Now, like we're working with, you know, a lot of like imperfect data, you know, sample sizes are only so big. We don't have a complete picture. It could change any day, but that's just what it suggests right now. Hmm. Now, like you said earlier, there is very strong evidence that Polynesians did come about 800 years ago. They hit South America. They met people there. They took the sweet potato back to Polynesia. And at some point, some Polynesian person and a Andean person had kids and their genes are still in the Polynesian, like are still in Polynesian genomes to this day. So there's very good genetic evidence that that encounter happened, but that's only 800 years ago. I mean, the America's already way populated mm-hmm. at that point. Mm-hmm. But what, you know, one thing that troubles me, this is probably uh, not a popular idea, but why do people have to mate in order for them to have made contact? Because it seems to me like even in the mainland in Europe, you see isolated ethnic groups that don't interbreed with one another. Is it possible that they there could have been contact with peoples that didn't result in genetic introductions? Is it sure? Yeah, I don't see why not. Yeah, I, I think I, I don't. Yeah, no, I think that that's perfectly reasonable. I mean, you know, you can get ideas from people that you hate and that you're going to have nothing to do with. I mean, I don't think every encounter necessarily has to leave a genetic mark. It's just where there's genetic marks you can say aha like you know there was an encounter we know that for but just sure. because it's not there doesn't mean that it couldn't have happened so there's a number of so really interesting congruences right uh, architectural or symbology that you see that are in in parts of the world that shouldn't really be related and it seems like the archaeologists are usually saying these people just happened upon the same symbology or the same architectural motifs, or the same masonry techniques. But I think they're basing that on the fact that there isn't genetic influence going on. Like, we met with this guy from, uh, was it UCLA, I believe, who was studying the Shimao culture in ancient Li-min, China. Yeah. What's that? Li Min. Li Min, yeah, Dr. Li mm-hmm. Min. And he was uncovering these incredible facades at this ancient Chinese city, and they were you know, uncannily Mesoamerican looking in their oh, renditions, the faces. Mm-hmm. And what was interesting was that they, they seem to have been added to this facade, this big wall around the city much later. And they were kind of placed upside down. They weren't part of the normal st- masonry. And so he was saying that the popular idea was that they had come from an earlier civilization somewhere. But this is way before the Aztecs or the Mayans, you know, a thousand years so he's, before. So he's saying that like the these had already been created before the blocks are just getting reused basically. Exactly, yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. It's really, uh, yeah, we should send you a, a picture of it after the podcast. It's really stunning. Some of these facades, they just look, it's hard to not see them as Mesoamerican, but they're way before the Mesoamericans were doing this same mm-hmm. uh, stylization. Yeah. It's yeah. like 2000 BC, 2000 BC. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And yeah, so right about the time that, uh, yeah, it's about right about the time the Olmec are getting started. Mm hmm. They look, they look distinctly Mayan or Aztec to me. Um, and I, I guess I'm not as familiar with the Olmec. When I think of the Olmec, I think of these big heads, right? These big, yeah. Mm-hmm. That are... Uh, that. Can, almost, you, can I... Uh, actually, I think I can send you this by email. Yeah, and you can you look at it. It's worth checking out. Let me, all right, well, let me take a look here. But it really... I don't know. It, it seems like it's, it's, it's treated as... Oh, it's, it's very spooky and strange. But the, since these people weren't breeding... There's no way that they could have had contact with each other. Or it's not maybe even so much that there's no way. It's just not part of the narrative that's being entertained. And um, actually, actually, that has been there's an archaeologist that has actually proposed a China Mesoamerican connection. And that's um, Betty Meggers. She's she's no longer alive now, but um, she used to be um, at the Smithsonian, actually, in Washington, D.C. And she had a theory that like Olmec civilization basically had influence from China. Hmm. And, you know, even though I'm personally a little skeptical of that, like, you know, like, you know, she, you know, she clearly thought that the idea had merit and everything, you know, 
questions. There was another guy that we've been meaning to talk to who's been looking at petroglyphs and has been identifying ancient Chinese characters in the petroglyphs. Oh, interesting. Um, Which, like in the Americas, I assume? Yeah, like he's in, mm-hmm. he's in New Mexico and Arizona, and he's mm-hmm. using filters to take pictures from underneath the desert varnish. And mm-hmm. so things that have been effaced, he's pulling out these this symbology that corresponds to ancient Chinese. And he went and he found ancient Chinese scholars and was presented. It was showing them these pictures, and they were like, "Yeah, that's like that's the word for mountain. That's the word for river. Like these are things that mm-hmm. appear to contain information that spans cultures in this dramatically similar way that seems like impossible because uh, the colors I can imagine being accidental." And like, okay, so you have like an overlap of black for south, yellow well, you, and you red. You can explain that with diffusion too, in some sense. But it has to be really early diffusion. There's some other things like these, uh, we were talking about the, I think it was the, the Tiwanaku we said. So am I saying mm-hmm. that right? Yeah, Tiwanaku. Yeah, mm-hmm. So they had those same uh, metallurgy, the, the same bronze clamps that they joined their stones with. We see those in Egypt. We see those in yeah. ancient Greece. And you can look at it and be like, well, I guess maybe they could come up with the same idea, but they're so similar looking. It's just mm-hmm. bizarre. It's almost just seems like someone told them, you know, hey, you could do this. At the, at the end of the day, I mean, the, the way that I look at it is I'm just like, you're putting huge blocks together. You have to hold them, you know, some way. If you have metal, you know, you know, making a clamp is, I think, you know, like a pretty easy solution that people are going to, you know, that are going to come up with. I mean, you know, similar problems, I think usually elicit similar solutions, you know, like there's, I can't think of any other way you'd like hold a block together, but you know, I'm not a, uh, I'm not in construction or engineering. So, I mean, but then you would expect to be able to find it across almost all cultures, right? So it wouldn't be exceptional that it's used in Mesoamerica and it, or in Tiwanaku and Greece and Egypt, but it would be in the Indus Valley, it would be in Mesopotamia, it would be in China, you would be able to find it in all these places. And I don't know if that's the case or not. Yeah, I mean, I could just imagine different shaped ones, like dumbbell-shaped ones. Or oh, you're saying that specifically, like, this individual shape. clamps or... Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it, you're absolutely right. And that's the that's the standard story that's written about in the archaeological journals. It's like, well, people just came up with the same idea. And it's like, fair enough, like, that definitely is possible. Mm-hmm. But the more you look at them, the more you're just plagued by this, like, oh, like the side-by-sides on Wikipedia are quite interesting. They yeah. compare uh, one of the temples in ancient Greece to the Tiwanaku temple or whatever it was building. And it's just, I don't know. It kind of makes the hairs on your neck stand up. It's pretty, (laughs) pretty incredible. But like I say, you know, this is mostly defended on account of the fact that there wasn't intermixing between those populations. Mm -hmm. And so there's nothing defensible that you can say. It's like, it has to remain this like absolutely remote Mm -hmm. possibility. If, if that, I think we need to talk to somebody who studies the genetic tracing process because it's yeah. like there's probably something in there that is some first principle that lets us arrive at this and if mm. that first principle is somehow suspect about the way that genomes maintain information it's like how far back can we really do they have to be mating that's what i'm like hung up well because i'm like humans would mate like if you're Does exchanging blocks like what you're gonna like send a work party over to teach them how to make blocks and all those guys are basically like choir boys like are you just sending eunuchs probably not women no, but women. there yeah. probably are win- women in situ. And so, like, y- in order for them to not mate, you have to have dudes that show up that are, like, mm-hmm. like, like well, alter- they're not welcomed uh, as people. Well, and yeah. typically when people, well, and typically I think when people, you know, kind of move from, like, you know, one culture to another and, like, they're staying there, they're contributing to the culture, they're typically getting assimilated into it. So they're either bringing, like, their wife, you know, their wife, their kids who are then going to like marry into that society or they just marry into it themselves. You know, doesn't know. I, you know, I, and like I said, I don't think it always has to work that way, but I think that's how people would expect it to work. And this In is like a zebras, world, I think not so, but... like horses, not zebras thing, right? Where you're like, if they show up, mm-hmm. you would expect them to interbreed. I don't, I don't know why, because I think that there's isolate, look, you wouldn't What's the have, mechanism? Okay, so they're showing, up, they're showing up and they're friendly enough to be able to give them the ma- masonry techniques. Well, hold on, like, back it up. Like, so just in the old world, Europe, uh, Mesopotamia area, you still have ethnic enclaves, right? 
where there's ethnically, genetically distinct populations from one another, they're not breeding with each other. They, they couldn't, or you wouldn't have ethnicities. So, um, so if I, so as I understand it, like the reason why that happens is because you have like, you know, most people in that population are staying and like only, you know, marrying and having kids with, you know, people within so like large an area. And then that produces a genetic signature. But if like a group of people were to, you know, like if like a chunk of that population were to migrate, you know, like, you know, a hundred miles over to like where the next culture is, you know, their genes are going to get passed through that population and through everybody in it. Now, like, I don't know, you know, like I'm not a geneticist. I don't know like how you like time all of those things and like put them in a sequence. Again, if you get a geneticist on the show, ask them, they'll give you a much better answer. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I just, I think that there's the, those people who wander, I think probably have a particular genetic lineage. And I wonder if that lineage can't just show up as background in the DNA of humans as a whole. Do you know what I mean by that? Where it's like the way that genetic analysis is done is you're usually looking for mutations and comparing them against Mm -hmm. populations. And so you find a gene that has some mutation Mm -hmm. that's specific to this area. Mm -hmm. And then you're like, okay, it's specific to this area, but the people in the next valley don't have it. Or Mm -hmm. they only like only 10% of them have it or whatever. And so you start to create these maps on that basis, but you're if there's a portion of the DNA that like everybody has, mm-hmm. and that's the part that gets sourced from the wanderers, you'd never be so, able to clearly find the wanderers in that in that background, I feel like. So the way that you would do that, basically to put all of that like in a historical context, you need to find DNA, like ancient DNA, DNA from like ancient people. So, you know, it's one thing to like look at DNA and be like, Oh, you know, these people share these genes and these people share these genes. Well, if you can find like a burial from, you know, like 9,000 years ago that, you know, that has, you know, a certain genetic signature, you can say, Oh, well, this guy clearly has, you know, these genes and these genes, we can say he's ancestral to like these people, but not these people. So when you're looking at genetics, like, putting that into like a historical context, like you need to have ancient DNA samples. And that's really, really hard to get because, you know, DNA breaks down over time and getting, you know, like, you know, getting mitochondrial DNA or like full nuclear DNA is really difficult when, you know, a body's been there for, you know, thousands of years how's that even possible that just blows my mind that people can get dna from thousands of year old material it's very difficult what is the oldest uh what is the oldest piece of dna they pulled off a skeleton i mean i I think that you really probably don't get the whole dna either right it's just they've 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 done whole genome sequencing of neanderthals i know that much it's crazy getting the whole g so from the book i read basically they said that getting like an entire full genome is very, very, very rare. Like, that's extraordinary to get from an ancient specimen. What is more often recovered is mitochondrial DNA because the DNA that's in your mitochondria basically gets passed down from your mother's side. Like, it's it's matrilineal, basically. Um, and because, like, there's... I forget why exactly it's easier to recover mitochondrial DNA, but, um, but it is easier to recover that. So typically when you look at really old specimens, that's what they're recovering. It's not the full genome. It's just the mitochondrial DNA. I think it might be easier to recover because there's more of it. Yeah. Like there's many, many copies. And typically when you're getting it, like you're extracting it from like, you know, you're not, you're extracting it from something like, you know, the inside of like teeth or something, um, because, you know, it, um, DNA preserves in there a lot longer, or, you know, if it's, you know, like if you're recovering somebody from like the Arctic, you know, you might find like hair or tissue that you can do. But again, like that's really, really rare. You know, it's so easy to contaminate that stuff or, you know, you do everything right. You sequence it and, it, you know, you come up with nothing. 
Yeah, and I just I feel like there's probably a lot of information that's missing, and so it feels so when when we do these explorations of specific topics, I feel like we always come up against places where it's apparent that the cutting edge has started to give us a complete picture of the past in some ways. Like mm-hmm. genome sequencing technology is kind of magic. You can mm-hmm. you can get this fragment of DNA and you pull it out and you can do this reconstruction of relational trees and mm-hmm. it, it suddenly gives you this glimpse of the past that you never had before. Mm-hmm. But then when you think about like what we're talking about here, which is like, well, how much survives? And Mm -hmm. what is the complete story versus what is the fragment that you have? And so we have this tendency of building on the fragment as being what is most certain. But you almost have to maintain this perspective like a magic eye picture where you're like, well, this is just one piece of the whole thing and you have to be able to fit it into this larger story. And I wonder how much of it is being is is being included in archaeology as a discipline or is it still like gen- geneticists are over here and they occasionally get samples or like archaeologists obsessed with reconstructing these genetic relationships um that's a that's a much better question for like for an archaeologist or a geneticist um depending on i mean you know archaeology at the end of the day there's a lot of um there's like a lot of interdisciplinary like um collaboration that happens in there so you know you might be you know if you're like digging an archaeological site yeah like you might have somebody who's trying to like recover genetic information from like human or animal remains you might have somebody who is like you know a like archaeobotanist who's just looking at like the plant remains the pollen samples and everything um so yeah i mean you know there is a lot of collaboration that goes on, but like when, how, like what the criteria for that is, I couldn't say, you know. Right on. But I guess the the question is like, as you're reading archaeology papers Mm -hmm. and you're reading books on archaeology, are people in contemporary papers discussing genetics and genomic relationship or genealogies? Or is it, does it tend to be more focused on the, you know, conventional, archaeological topics and then you have to like go searching Mm -hmm. for the papers that are like okay this is a genetic analysis of this site okay so yeah in my experience the papers tend to be specialized more often than not so you know you will find so if like if something's written by an archaeologist it is mainly going to deal with the archaeology if something is you know written by a geneticist it's going to focus mostly on the genetics now like occasionally People are going to, like, draw on information. They might say, like, oh, you know, our genetic evidence shows this, but recent archaeological evidence shows, you know, like this instead, you know. But they're not going to go into, like, huge detail on it. You know what I mean? Like, there, I, people, I think, you know, these people, I think, try to, like, stay in their own lanes, in their own area of expertise. Um, I don't see a lot of people like synthesizing it like all into one work, which is why I really, the book I mentioned earlier, that's why I really, really liked it because, um, because this woman did try to do just that. And it was awesome. And as someone who has written about the topic, it is a super hard topic to write about because you want to construct a narrative, but there's so many gaps in the information There's information that seemingly contradicts each other. You can't just make this straight narrative without putting like a million asterisks on the side. That seems like the case for archaeology in general, right? Yeah, it's always an incomplete (laughs) picture. Like, yeah. This is like an incomplete picture of an incomplete picture because we're already operating in this really just dispersed. Mm Mm-hmm residue of cultures and time i want to ask if you have any idea why the peopling occurred so late because there was presumably humans wandering around asia and hominids at least for millions of years before that and we'd had multiple interglacial yeah multiple of the multiple like glacial periods where these land bridges sort of appeared why so late so so as i understand it um Early hominins, like, you know, like um, Homo erectus, you know, the first hominin to, like, get out of Africa and everything, they 
are they never go into like very cold areas like Beringia and the Land Bridge are. Now Neanderthals are adapted for the cold, but um what separates Neanderthals from Homo sapiens is that Homo sapiens get very good at making warm clothing. They invent the needle, they're able to like make clothes out of different materials. They can survive in much colder, harsher weather than Neanderthals can. I think that is what allows them to like get into the Arctic and actually survive there. There's an archaeological site in Siberia called the Yana rhinoceros horn site, which is this is this big site in Siberia. It's got like all these like it's got like all these animal remains, you know, um, all these like tools and like you know. Um, like all these tools, all these like, you know, cultural artifacts and stuff. And it's almost four and it's like it's over thirty thousand years old. Like right. that's before that site was discovered, like nobody thought, you know, humans were living in the Arctic, much less could survive in it. But that site shows people figured it out like way before. Now again, like you look at that site and you're like, well, did anybody like cross into America? Like, you know, the way would have been open then. And the Best evidence that there is in America, in my opinion, is the White Sands footprints, which I'm sure you guys are familiar with. And that dates to like 20 to 23,000 years ago. Um, there are older sites. They tend to have a lot more controversy like around them, around like the dating, the interpretation of the material at the site and so forth. But, you know, like I said, it's possible, like humans could have gone in there at that time. Like I have no doubt. It's just, did they, is the question, is there proof? Like, again, we don't have a complete picture. We can only work with what we've got. It seems like those dates move back every few years. It's definitely oh, yeah. much earlier than it was when I was a kid. Well, the White Sands one was to 23,000 years, I think. Yeah, because yeah, they found, and it was that they found like a, mm-hmm. they found like a pollen grain that they analyzed and were like this corresponds to the climate at this time and so it must mm-hmm. have been at this age. Yeah. So a ri- when they did the original study, um, what they did is they dated uh, seeds, ditch grass seeds that were pressed into the soil. You know when the footprints were made, and they carbon dated that. There was some pushback among archaeologists because people said, and this and this is very fair criticism, but they basically said, hey, those dates could come back much older than they than they actually are, because when you have aquatic plants and animals, they can absorb carbon that's much older than like than what the plant has, and that can skew the age. It's called the marine reservoir effect. Mm-hmm. And that was totally legitimate criticism. Now Two months ago, a new study came out about White Sands where they basically did more dating and they take different materials. So, like, they used optical um, OSL dating, what optically stimulated luminescence dating, and then they also dated some pollen samples, like you said. And those dates came back around the same time, like twenty-one to twenty-three thousand year window. And so now those dates look a lot a lot more secure, a lot more robust. I think it's harder to argue that, the, you know, that that dating is wrong or that it got skewed somehow. I often wonder how much of this evidence is just buried beneath the water because it seems like if you were going to explore, you would explore along the coast. And how much of that mm-hmm. ancient coastline remains? Well, none of it for sure. But how many artifacts would even persist at this point? So, so this is actually funny that you bring this up because this is something I literally read this week because i always said the same thing too like oh yeah like all the pleistocene like shoreline it's like you know it's a hundred meters underwater like it's buried there but apparently there are like some areas like in alaska like some of those islands where the pleistocene shore isn't buried Hmm. and the paper i read didn't go into detail about it but the point that the paper was making is like oh well we have like some areas where the Pleistocene shore is still exposed and like we haven't found any artifacts that are older than you know Mm. x date and i remember reading it and being like wait how do they know it like wasn't submerged like that's really interesting i'm guessing it has something to do with isostatic rebound that 
you know, as the glacier retreats, the land goes up and maybe that offsets the water. You know, I don't know. I haven't mm. dug into it yet, but, but yeah, like, and of course we don't know if are some areas, we don't know if that's j- just wasn't a popular Island or whatever too. Exactly. Point, so. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You never yeah, know what you don't know. Yeah. At some point, someone's going to have to just do like, a nice big underwater survey down the West coast. If they want to find, you know, evidence that people were there. But how long does that survive underwater? Like how long will the Titanic even be there? Do you think you, there are some under, there are some underwater sites um, and some old ones at that, that have been found in North America. There's one in Florida that's called the page Ladson site where it's a really small site, but basically it's um, like, it's a bunch of mammoth remains. It's a mammoth butcher site. Um, that was once like a little, like, like a small little like lake. And basically somebody, you know, killed a mammoth, butchered part of it, carried it away. But in the bones, like they found a tool that had like broken as somebody was butchering it. So obviously, you know, we know that, you know, that somebody was butchering a mammoth there that like, it's a human made artifact. So if you found something like that, Mm. you know, on the coast, like you don't need to do, you know, you don't need to like find a whole campsite or anything, Mm. you know, all the organic material is going to be gone, but you can find signs like that. Oh, somebody was here at this time. And then, you know, you like date, you know, date the bones or, you know, whatever other artifacts you can, and you can arrive at a date and Paige Ladson, if I'm remembering correctly, it's like 14 and a half thousand years old. It's so like, it's, it's a really old site. How did, how did they come up? Did somebody n- suspect it would be there and then went looking for it? Because, you know, it, it seems like a lot of archaeology is done by just tripping over an artifact in a farm field, you know, and then <laughs> yeah. you send in the, the squad. The archaeological to troops. It, right? Yeah. That's a great question. I do not know how they found out about that site. Mm-hmm. So, hey, I know that there's the Cerruti Mastodon site. Yeah. Is that what it's mm-hmm. called down in San yeah, Diego? Yeah, Cerruti Mastodon. Mm-hmm. Yep. And is the and it's super controversial because the guy who's working oh, yeah. on it is like, this is evidence of advanced peopling at fifth, 150,000 years ago. 120 to 130. Okay. But yeah. But yeah, really like old, like, like we're we're, we're almost adding almost like things <laughs> ever left Africa, like really, really early. <laughs> and people are really upset with this. And is that because the evidence is just not there, and he's he's kind of like pulling things which which he shouldn't, or why is that? So again, this is this is just my opinion. I'm not an expert, but the evidence I think is very circumstantial. You know, it's like, because you, okay, so you have like, you know, you have these mastodon or mammoth bones, I forget which one it is, but you basically have these bones, they're broken, there are these, like, cobbles that are near them, the idea is basically that, you know, these bones, that these cobbles were basically used to, like, break the bones so that people could, like, break them open. There's no other, there's like no knives, there's no scrapers, there's no other tools like that, nothing that is definitively man-made just these cobbles um and they did exp- they did um the team that excavated the site like did experiments where like they basically did the same thing they took cobbles and they took like cow bones or something broke them and you know kind of twisted them open to like get to the marrow inside they found that the breaks were similar and kind of like that was like a big like argument that they used a lot of other archaeologists pointed out like yeah the breaks look similar because you literally devised a way to make the same kind of break you know there's no proof that like a hominid did that you know so that's where so yeah like that's where the controversy is is just is just how we're interpreting what's there. Like nobody disagrees that like the site is as old as it is. Everybody agrees on that. It's just how is that interpreted? Did you see the paper that came out a couple months ago about the uh, wood that they found? I think it was in Africa that they're proposing is 450,000 years old. I can't say I've seen it. No, but that sounds really like, do you like, was it wood? Like, how did they recover it? Like, is it like charcoal or is it like, preserved in something or it's a great question that i don't have the answer to but okay I th- think do you remember what it's called 
It was like, what can I search? Like ancient rafter or something? Yeah. So they think that it was like the rafter of a building. You could do like 450,000 year old wood Neanderthals. Is it like carved or something? Like, do they know it's been like modified by humans? They think so, because basically what it is, is it looks like it's a beam in a ceiling where one of them has been notched to like fit over Uh, the other one. Okay. Interesting. And it has this like really nice shape to it. So it definitely looks like something Mm. that's been shaped. And, but it's crazy to think about that being so far back. And I just, I was wondering if you had formed an opinion on it yet. No, no, I've, yeah, that's the first time I've heard of it. I'll have to, yeah, I'll have to read about that after. Did you get a chance to look at that picture of the she- the block from Shimo? Um, I pulled it up. It's actually asking for... Uh, there should be a picture that's just part of the here. email. Oh. Oh, you're right. Here it is. Okay, sorry. I just saw the link and just clicked that right away. Okay, yeah. That is interesting. Yeah, it does have a very... Yeah, I see what you mean. The patterns around the face. Like, oh. yeah, have a very, yeah, Mesoamerican look to them and the guy's just like okay so cloud levi strauss who's you know king of the anthropologists is like yeah they create these patterns because of the human subconscious and the human subconscious is universal and so the patterns Mm -hmm. are universal and lee uh lehman kind of added he's like they could have been licking the same toads and seeing the same gods (laughs) and so like maybe but it does really seem to suggest that there is a flow of idea because the simplest explanation is that the ideas actually flowed and if the ideas flowed then that means that there's stuff that's older that we just haven't found yet or that people are taking their inspiration from like the same thing you know yeah yeah and that's that's a pretty unpopular view of view of history right because it's like the the current this is why graham hancock gets all of the pushback yeah so actually so i actually think that like like, I actually think that there's a lot of truth in that. What I would say, though, is that everybody looks at the same night sky. They look at the same celestial bodies. They look at, like, the same nature around them. They see the same patterns in nature. You know, you can look at flowers and they'll, like, you know, develop in certain ways. There'll be certain patterns in them. And, you know, anybody can see that, you know, can, like, see, um, can see that in nature and then build upon it, incorporate it into their culture, their knowledge or whatever they're doing. And so that will, you know, kind of produce similarities across the world because everybody is interact, you know, everybody's on the same planet. They're interacting with, you know, nobody's on the moon here. You know, they're all interacting in the same natural environment. And yet they come up with this pattern only in, in China and then Mesoamerica, right? It's not like you see that same art style in, in Egypt. And I, I mean, I couldn't say I'm not an expert on those. So I don't want to say that I'm hesitant to say like, oh, this couldn't be anywhere else. It might be like, I, I just don't know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, from, from everything that I've looked at, the symbols, you're totally right where it's like the snake. Yeah. yeah. The snake mm-hmm. appears everywhere. It's on the every sun, single yeah. continent. Mm-hmm. The sun. The, so yeah. you have these building Even blocks. Star constellations. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And we've been it's like. It's just the style that, that really mm-hmm. gives me pause with, yeah. with that one. Yeah, definitely. But I mean, I don't know. Hopefully, hopefully, we somebody will find the uh, the original city that it belongs to, if it truly does belong to something earlier. Because so much of history mm-hmm. must be somebody building something, and then it falling into disrepair, and somebody else coming by and being like, "Hey, I am in need of blocks." Yeah. Because mm-hmm. I'm like, imagine civilization collapses, and in Egypt, people need to build things. Would they take the pyramids apart? There was that just too- yeah, they took all the faces. <laughs> well, it it <laughs> yeah. used to be covered in... The stones are gone. Right? It was covered in beautiful to, um, uh, masonry, right, originally? The, the, the blocks seem like they're harder to move, though. Not like the, the blocks, but like the really nice yeah. facey stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. What were you going to say? And like, well, I was just going to say, like, the like there are sites that have smaller pyramids that are just like, they're almost completely gone because people just quarried them. And unlike the Great Pyramids, you know, like, those are small. You can just kind of go in there and, like, take out whatever blocks you need. The Great Pyramids are huge. I'm guessing they're a little more daunting to uh, take blocks from. And also, the blocks on the inside of the pyramid, you know, are not 
cut that well if you actually look at them like the casings like the casing stones are really well cut they're really finely fitted together but like the inside it's they're not cut to that same you know to that same uh you know precision you know mm-hmm. yeah i think like if you go back to greece messier you go back to greece and like some of these temples like the temple of artemis has like one column left you know it was you like go to visit the place and there's like <laughs> three or four stones and like a single column left because people just <laughs> jacked it all over. And that wasn't even as long as some of these other ones that we've been talking about. Do you think the I same thing to... was happening in the Americas where people were, oh, abs- oh go ahead. Oh, a- absolutely. I mean, I mean, the question is this, like if, you know, if you're trying to build something, you need a certain, you need like some material and there's a giant pile of it somewhere this building that's fallen over or this building that nobody uses anymore you can either cut new blocks or you can just kind of take the blocks that are there and reshape them and if i did not care about that building i can tell you right now which option i would choose i would just go with what's already there yeah, it's amazing there's anything left from from antiquity i don't know his history is not kind to history it's <laughs> destructive <laughs> What are the what are the, what are the topics that you're spending most of your time mapping out right now? So you can probably guess one because I've mentioned it a lot, and that's the peopling of the Americas. Um, that's one thing I've been reading up a lot. I'm thinking about. I actually already have an episode on it, but it was even though it wasn't the first episode I released, it was the first one that I started researching and writing before I ever released a video. And so, like, you know, it's, for one thing, it's outdated. There are are developments that have happened since then that have changed our understanding. And I've just gotten better at, you know, better at research and stuff. And so I would like to have an up-to-date video on that. Um, I did a lot of Mesoamerican topics this year. So I want to do, I want to focus a little bit more on North America, but I'm still kind of figuring out what I want to do there. And then one of my goals for next year is I want to make an episode on the Moisca because there's almost nothing about them out there, which is a tragedy because they're extremely fascinating. They're very interesting. Nobody remembers them. All the good stuff is in Spanish, which is why it's very difficult to research. Um, And I've wanted to do an episode on them since the day I started the channel, but it's just the research takes so long, but now I've got like, you know, I've like got some people helping me with it. I've gotten like more sources. So I'm hoping to have that episode out next year, but we'll see. Everything needs to go. Who are the Moisca? Yeah, I don't know anything about them. Uh, They are. So they were the indigenous um, people living in Colombia, like in the, Bogota area, the capital of Colombia today, living in that area when the Spanish arrived. Not part of the Incan civilization. No, no. They were they were different. If you know, like, if you're familiar with like the El Dorado legend, like they are heavily linked with that legend. Like they had um like they had a lot of gold. Um, and if you even go to uh, Colombia today um, in Bogota there's a big museum that is just the museum of gold and it's like a whole bunch of like gold artifacts from that area like it's it's stunning like how much there is is this a case like the old copper culture where they just had abundant access to raw gold it was it just like um, sticking out of mountains and I on it that's a good question I honestly don't know if it was local or if they were trading for it from other areas. Again, you know, just stuff I need to research. What drew you to them in the first place? So, when you read about... So, I originally heard about them through, like, the Spanish conquest of the Americas. You know, everyone's going to know, you know, everyone's going to know the conquest of Mexico. You know, everybody knows about, you know, Cortes and the Aztecs. Everybody knows about Pizarro and the Inca. Um, the Muisca are, are a really interesting conquest in of themselves because they're one of the, they're one of the few like other peoples where it's a very sophisticated civilization. It's a very wealthy civilization and, you know, they get conquered by the Spanish, 
I don't think it's as popular in literature because there's no like there's not much of a climax to it. There's no like great last battle or last stand of the Muisca. They kind of just get like divided up and then conquered piecemeal. They were never like an empire either. It's more like a confederation of like different tribes and like cities. It looks like they were able to field an army though, by our old definition. It seems oh, like yeah. <laughs> it seems like the each tribe would contribute soldiers to to a bigger. It's, it feels like a state a little bit. It's quite yeah. interesting. There seems to be some ingredient of difference between state and empire. Like not every state aspires to be an empire. For sure. Or do you yeah. think that every state does, and then just gets knocked down, and then comes to terms with their position in the civilizational totem pole? So my definition of an empire is basically a state that has like different um like different peoples in it like different nations of people in it. So you know, you you'll have a you'll you know, you can have a state and everybody in that state is more or less the same cultural or ethnic identity. An empire you basically have many cultures, many different identities in there. So you know, let's just take like the Aztecs, for instance, you know, the Aztecs ruled an empire that had, you know, had Aztecs, it had Totonacs, it had Mixteca, you know, Zapotecs, um, you know, Atomis, lots of other peoples with their own culture, their own language. And then you compare that to say, like, you know, a Maya kingdom, you know, everybody in that kingdom is ethnically Maya, they all speak the same language. So you would never make any reference to like a Maya empire or anything because it's all just city states that are just ruling Maya people. And for the Muisca, they were localized to this one area in, yeah. mm -hmm. in around Bogota, you said. Yeah, yeah, in the uh like in the Altiplano up there. Mm -hmm. And do you have a sense of who they came from? Uh still figuring that out out yeah how do you so, go about figuring that out you just you just got to read a bunch of, you just got to read a bunch of books and read a bunch of articles until you feel comfortable enough to write a script on it <laughs> do you do you ever find yourself constructing your own like how often do you read something where you're like i actually think that's bullshit um not <sighs> Like theoretical, that's a, that's a good yeah, question. like a, th a good, theoretical that's a, reconstruction. That's a that's a good question. Sometimes I come across that, and it, it's interesting because usually if I have that reaction, like this doesn't sound real, this doesn't sound correct, I'll basically like you know like make a note of that and then keep my eyes peeled for when I'm reading other sources because if they're also like saying the same thing and like making reference to it, that makes me feel a little bit comfortable. But yeah, I mean there are you know there are times where like I come across something like that and I'm like, okay, why does nobody else mention this? Like, this is weird. This sounds like a very odd idea. Like, I don't know. And then if I was going to include that in like a script, I'd probably just like make some sort of, um, I'd probably make some sort of disclaimer. Like, you know, this archeologist says this, you know, you can take this idea or leave it, you know? And then, um, and then, yeah, if I ever put my own speculation in there, which isn't that common, like, again, I preface it with the same thing, like, you know, this is just my opinion, but this kind of looks like this. But oh. you, you're kind of in a position where you're reading a lot of this primary literature, and you probably have more time to think about it than somebody who, in terms of reading the whole field, versus somebody who is constantly going on digs and worried about grants and doing that thing. Like This is a perennial problem inside of the academy, which is that when you're running a lab, how much time do you really have to go and read widely on a, a, a large variety of subjects that allows you to feed all your knowledge back on it? And so I wonder if you come across things as you do that, not in identifying, hey, this guy says something, but nobody else does, but more in, this is the way that the story has been reconstructed, but I actually think that they're missing something. Especially in terms of the interactions with other civilizations that you study, because you've studied so many different civilizations at this point. Yeah, like I feel like your breadth of subject matter familiarity is way bigger than somebody who's studying... Only you know, one culture. The like specific dwellings of a mm -hmm. specific era in Teotihuacan, and that's like 
all that they do. I feel like after a while, you'll start... I feel like I've started to, you know, see certain patterns or, like, come to expect certain things. So if it's like, okay, you know, this culture, they're, you know, like, their main substance is, you know, corn farming, basically. You know, you can expect, you can always expect, and again, like, not a hard and fast rule, but just something I've noticed, will always have like a god or a deity that is just all about movies, you know, and it's all about corn. They'll have like some corn god in their pantheon or in their mythology, which when you think about it, like is kind of odd because, you know, like in the old world, it's not like there's a wheat god or like a barley god, hmm. but, but like you can bet in the America is like, if they're growing corn, there is, you know, a good chance that there is a corn god somewhere in the pantheon or someone in mythology that has a very important role, you know, around corn. Okay. So that's actually really fascinating. What do you make of there not being a wheat God and there being a maize God? I'd never thought about that. I just had a hilarious vision of future archaeologists digging up like a, the Hamburglar from McDonald's or something. And, <laughs> you know, thinking that we, we worship these things. I was thinking the Michelin man. Any of those, right? The burger God. <laughs> But, but so my theory about that is, is that, um, is that as corn, like I, like I said earlier, you know, corn gets domesticated in Mexico, it kind of spreads out from there. And that as corn makes its way into different cultures, it's not just the corn that's getting shared. There's a whole story and mythology behind corn. That's also coming with it. And I like to imagine that, you know, like somebody moves to a new area, you know, and they have like their bag of like corn seeds so that they can plant them wherever they're going. And, you know, they find a nice area. They, you know, like, you know, they get their field ready. They plant their corn and people are in the area are like, oh, like, what are you planting? Like, oh, this is, you know, this is corn. This is what they grow in my hometown. Like, oh, like, what is, you know, what is this? How are you going to explain that to them? You know, like, they're not biologists. You're not going to explain it scientifically. But if you have a story behind it, a mythology behind it, you'll tell that story to them. You know, this is a gift from the gods. Let me tell you about it. And so I think, again, this is just my speculation, but I think that what, wherever corn goes, there is a mythology that's being brought with it. And then that mythology gets picked up by, you know, by other people. And I mean, most cultures through most, I would say like most religions through most history have no issues just adding like, you know, new gods, new myths, like into their, um, you know, into their religion. It's just, you know, it's fine with them. So. You know, everybody just picks up these elements and just incorporates them into their own beliefs. Well, it seems kind of unique, too, because in other parts of the world, I feel like each state develops its own grain to some extent. Like, mm -hmm. they're not all having the same grain. There's this diffusion of corn, right? I mean... Oh, you mean in the old... In, in the, the old world, the old uh, world. whatever you want to call it. I, I'm running... I don't know what we're supposed to call... Eurasia. Eurasia. After, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it seems like there's a bunch of different grains. Like, each culture is centered around some grain. Like, you have, uh, I don't even know. Yeah, I guess you have. Well, rice isn't European. Like, the, the rice is a steppe culture. Like, I think that well, it's Well, that's in the, China, isn't it? That's in it? China, yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. And so, you have, like, the Mongolians who mm -hmm. brought rice to the steppes, but you don't really get it much in Europe. And in Europe, I guess you have, like, I know that uh, buckwheat is popular among the Slavs, but so is wheat. Like, I, I don't can't think of a single culture in Europe that's not eating some bread product. Maybe, maybe it was wheat. Yeah, maybe that's all. Maybe it and was like they similar. have a bunch of different kinds of wheat. Like, I think that if you start mm -hmm. looking through the heirloom varieties, you find like hard winter red, hard winter white, <laughs> soft summer white. Like, I don't know mm -hmm. my my wheats, but 
wheat seems like it's really, really, really old because you go all the way back to the yeah. first things that are domesticated. But why and the mythology mm-hmm. associated with it? Maybe because it's just like it's so old. I like your idea of the story. Or maybe there, or maybe there was mythology and it's just, it's lost, you know? Mm. It just hasn't been passed down. Like, I wonder if like mm-hmm. Gobekli Tepe somewhere has a wheat god that we haven't figured out yet because mm. they would be the people who would be right around the time of figuring out that mythology but like Mm -hmm. you said something about the way that someone shows up with a bag of corn plants it and then tells a story Mm -hmm. if you've had corn for the last ten thousand years for the last five thousand years like what mythology do you have to tell about corn you're like do i tell a mythology about the like you mean wheat wheat yeah sorry sorry yeah if you have (laughs) wheat if you have wheat for ten thousand years like, what mythology do you tell about it? It just, it's like, it's the What thing. do you mean you haven't seen wheat before? <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> there's, a, there's a really funny thing in Russian where it's like, if you do something that's kind of stupid and uncouth, people are, my, my family was always like, what, have you never seen asphalt before? Which I was always like, that seems, maybe I haven't. <laughs> but yeah, you don't need a mythology of some god that creates it. And so Europeans just had it for too long. And... Maybe the transformation that's wrought by corn is really dramatic and significant. Mm. Because what is there to eat carb-wise before corn? Um, so if you're in South America, you have, let me think, you have, uh, you have quinoa, you have tons of like different tubers and roots like potatoes, sweet potatoes. Um, oka is like another popular tuber. There's another one that I'm forgetting. In the Americas, th- this is kind of like harder because no one's practicing agriculture full time. There are plants that are domesticated in there, like sunflowers, like marsh elder, goosefoot, like some other um, may grass is another. Um, but the people that are growing these and domesticating them aren't gro- like they're not farming them full time. You know what I mean? They're not staying in one spot. They're still there you know they're still moving around a lot like they're domesticating things that they can plant and then leave for six months or however long and then like come back to mm-hmm. I, see. I i think so i would need i'm not 100 percent sure but maybe you like plant it for like you know you might plant it for like a season kind of like stay in that general area and then pack up and move out and go to a whole different area the next year like I'm not 100% sure I would need to to read up on that a little more. In in general, do you have a sense of when you had these nomadic tribes, if they had like winter homes and summer homes that they would move between, or it was like a Mm -hmm. perpetual motion of never remaining in the same place over and over again? I would, I, everything that I've, everything that I've come across, people typically have, yeah, like you said, like winter regions and, summer regions there's a lot of seasonal movement that happens um whether or not you're i mean there's got to be exceptions where you know people are you know are alternating between like very few summer and winter locations or where they might be alternating between a lot of different ones um but yeah i don't know what that like like what the percentages of that would be. Mm -hmm. But that's a really good question. Hey folks, first Demystify Sci live event is happening this year in Austin, Texas on April 7th and 8th. Please come out, hang out, meet us, meet other curious investigator audience members. You can also hang out with our invited speakers that are going to be there, including Pierre Marie Robitaille, who's going to be speaking about the liquid metal sun and ushering us through the eclipse. So grab your ticket and I'll see you there. So you know, we've talked a lot about the inception of these different city states or civilizations, cultures. You must encounter the collapse of cultures a lot as well in your research. Mm-hmm. What are some of the unifying features that lead to transitions between these different powers across the Americas? If you have a culture, it will collapse. Uh-huh. <laughs> if there's like one thing I've come to appreciate from like all the reading I've done, it's just like nothing ever lasts forever. Like all these incredible, you know, states and cultures, like they, they just, they never last. And as far as things that. Are there unifying patterns to that? Yeah. Yeah. So 
I'm trying to think it because some so this kind of gets into a bigger question because sometimes you can look at the collapse of a like of a society or a culture and it's very obvious why it collapses you know there's like there's lots of violence you know there's probably like an uprising or a war or something or you know oh the you know water table dropped and these people couldn't practice agriculture here anymore and they had to move out sometimes it's very very clear why something collapse why like a um city or like a state will collapse and other times it's not clear at all it's just like well you know everything's going great and then it just ends you know everybody just left for some reason and we don't know why like if you read about the you know the maya collapse quote unquote um like there's not there's not one single reason why all of those cities just suddenly stop being inhabited, why they suddenly just get abandoned. There's lots of different reasons that fit like certain cities really well, but there's like no cause that explains them all. So it's really frustrating. And it's, it's almost like the because... people just got up and went back into the wood. Like they almost went back into the mountains, right? Yeah, like or they, they just they just left the build. They just sort of didn't find the cities appealing anymore. All of a sudden, yeah, yeah. Like it does look like that in a lot of ways. Like, yeah, it's just sometimes like it's funny because like there are certain Maya cities where you literally see like a monument is being carved, and it's just never finished. It's like somebody just you know didn't show up to work one paid. day and just and that was it. Like it you know and it was never finished. So like Teotihuacan's but... another interesting version of that. I feel like, mm -hmm. and it, and there must have been. I always think about how the Aztecs or the Mayans would have. I guess the Mayans were in some were more. I don't know how contemporary they were with the Teotihuacanis, but the Aztecs must have looked back at these ruins in their backyard and mm -hmm. and thought like, who? It seems like they they weren't totally aware of who those people were. Like the the yeah. whole. <laughs> the whole culture got lost for a while and then they, they take on a lot of their attributes because they must have revered them through some yeah. ancient memory. But still, it, it was as if people just got up one day and walked out and were just like, the mm. heck with cities. Yeah. <laughs> That's, is, I would say, Teotihuacan is actually inhabited like even after like it, you know, falls, quote unquote, like there are some people that still live there. But a place like Cahokia, I think is like a better example where like, it just gets like abandoned wholesale. Like hmm. people stop living there at a certain point. And then eventually, like, I think it's like a couple centuries later, there's like a little bit of habitation there, but like, it's, it's never a big city again. And yeah, it's just, yeah, you kind of get the impression that like, this was a bold new experiment. Nothing like this had ever been done in the Eastern woodlands. It's, you know, huge, massive city. There's, you know, these huge, you know, there's these huge mounds, this big thriving culture. There's like a government and, you know, these people are exerting like a lot of pressure in faraway areas and then it just all evaporates. And it's, yeah, it just makes you wonder like what, you know, what happened? Well, like, it's, it's, actually, it's a little bit of a house of cards, any of these civilizations, right? We all depend, like I depend on being able to go to the grocery store and pick up food yeah. for dinner. And if you're if you're depending on other people all the way down the line and all of a sudden that chain breaks, then mm -hmm. you got to revert to essentially living like your prehistoric ancestors all of a sudden. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's nothing to be done. I mean, you can imagine lots of like, I would imagine if like a plague showed up or something, you know, all sorts of things, maybe war, like it yeah. just became a really dangerous place. It could be crime. It could be pollu pollution, environmental hazards. It could be, there's, there's so many things that could just cause people to get that kind of uh, feeling about the city. But I always wonder how soon those people get together somewhere else and remake the thing. Or is it something that's lost after they do that? Because I tend to look at the history of civilizations as being a continuous line where I'm like, okay, so the oldest one that we have is Gobekli Tepe. But mm -hmm. Gobekli Tepe is roughly in the same region as ancient Mesopotamia. They're separated mm -hmm. by a couple thousand years, but I'm like, we haven't found the evidence for this, obviously, but... Many thousand years, yeah. They have, yeah, many, like, I think, like, 5,000 five five years? Yeah. Okay, five. so 
clearly something happened in between those two points, but yeah. were those the s- descendants of the Gobekli Tepe people who basically decided to like give it another go after they had licked their wounds for long enough? Or is it just somebody who reinvents it de novo without any of the ancient mythology of, you know, we once had a city on a hill? Like is modern America uh, giving it a new go of the ancient Greek and Roman civilizations? <laughs> you know, we have very similar looking state buildings. Mm-hmm. We still use the language in law and in medicine. And uh, somebody could probably make that case uh, several thousand years from now that we were just giving it another go. Well, there's a really clear intellectual tradition. If you look back, you know, like Plato and Aristotle, people still read them and still formulate their views of nature on their on their backs. And that's 5,000 years I was, ago. Yeah, I was going to say, like, all oh, the founding fathers were very aware of, you know, their, their you know, like that Roman and Greek like cultural heritage and everything and I think in a lot of ways they probably took elements that they liked of those cultures and you know imparted them on the country that they were making yeah and it's like they have writing and so we can look back and we can look to see mm -hmm. that like okay he wrote letters and he loved Plato and he wrote letters and he loved Aristotle and they were arguing about these things and we have all this textual analysis but I'm like Mm -hmm. certainly people are like wandering around in that area of Turkey Syria Iran, Iraq, where they're telling stories of what it looks like to build something massive. And Mm. maybe there's just not enough stability or enough time to be able to actually get it going again. Yeah. Or it's worth considering, I mean, maybe the people that left Cahokia, like, were fed up with it. You know, we look at that city and it awes us. You know what I mean? We get you know, we're blown away when, you know, you go there and you climb up Monk's Mound, you can see the St. Louis skyline from there because you're up really high. But, you know, as much awe as that inspires in us, maybe the people who left Cahokia did not feel that way. Maybe they were just like, you know what, like, that was a terrible place to live. You know, you know, they treated us terribly. We were oppressed. I mean, just because we have fond memories of something doesn't mean people back then had fond memories of it. It's so... This is, you know, just, you know, we might prize those stories and histories more than the people who lived there actually did. I mean, it's worth considering. Can, can you, can you t- catch people up really quick who might not know? I mean, people might have heard of Cahokia, but can you, can you give us a picture of what that place looked like during its heyday? So, um, so Cahokia is basically, it's in Illinois, right across the river from St. Louis, right where the Missouri and Mississippi River meet. So, you know, it was on a very strategic place um, because you have the confluence of two major rivers there. And Cahokia, if you go to the site today, you're really only seeing like a little bit of what's there because there were also mounds in St. Louis and East St. Louis. Like that whole area was just a massive, huge hub. I mean, it pro- like if you were walking it probably would have taken you like, you know, more than a day to walk through all of it. So it would have been, I mean, you know, it would have been, you know, like an urban, you know, center. It would have been surrounded by, you know, large farm fields. And then there's evidence of like, you know, pilgrimage sites, like out, like outside that area and stuff. It would have been a very vibrant place to be like you, you know, there would have been, you know, there would have been rulers, there would have been craftsmen, artisans, you know, there would have been engineers, there would have been artists, there would have been poets, you know, it would have been an incredible place to see. It's really the place that births Mississippian culture in the uh, eastern United States. And you see a l- Cahokia's influence all over, like all up and down the Mississippi River base. And it's really, really interesting. And what characterizes Mississippian culture? So there are, um, there are certain types of like art and artifacts and then like, um, mound building as well, like platform mounds. That's usually pretty diagnostic. Um, you can literally find artifacts in different areas that we know came from Cahokia because they can look at the material and say, this is only found like in the area around Cahokia. It has to come from there. Um, and then you find um, like, there's like certain like paraphernalia stuff, like uh, chunky stones, like they kind of look like hockey pucks, but they're part of like a uh, 
sport that was played there. You know, you can find those like all over like the Eastern woodlands. And again, we know from like the material that those were made out of that, like a lot of those came from Cahokia as well. So it seems so, yeah, you kind of like look at all that evidence and it kind of seems that like someone is like kind of spreading this Cahokian idea into into other places. Mm. And do you think that it arrives after Cahokia falls apart or do you think that it gets there before? I think it gets there before while Cahokia is in its heyday. Now, I'm sure like after it falls. Um, well, I guess I'm not sure, but it's very possible that after it falls, like it, it's former citizens and inhabitants take a lot of those ideas and material culture with them when they leave and settle elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Are they interacting with the contemporary Mesoamerican civilizations at all? That is a very hot topic. Ah, Um, So there are, because yeah, there are some people who will look at, you know, the mounds of Cahokia, especially like Monk's Mound, and they'll just kind of say, oh, you know, that, that looks just like a Mesoamerican pyramid. Like, surely there's some sort of you know somebody's like exchanging ideas or taking inspiration or copying someone's homework um but again people had built mounds in the eastern woodlands for thousands of years they were actually doing it longer than pyramids were being built in mesoamerica so there's like a long mound building tradition there they just never built them that big and that many of them in one area these are like burial mounds or just shaped mounds what 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 do you mean by mound mounds for people who aren't familiar so a mound is basically just an earthwork where you're you know you're basically like stacking earth up to i again you can do this for a couple of reasons You could have, like, a burial mound that you're making where you're burying, like, you know, like, honored dead in an area. And then you're just, like, putting a mound over them for some, you know, ritual or religious reason. Um, Other times you're making a mound that's just, you know, it's got a platform so that you can, like, put, you know, your house on there if you're the leader. Because, you know, you want to be able to, you know, see everything and have people Mm. look up to you. Or just stand Um, up there and talk, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then, I mean, you can make mounds for like some other purposes too. Like some of them can have, um, can have like ceremonial functions. Like if you look at Hopewell mounds, um, you have mounds that are made in such a way where like everything is oriented towards a specific celestial event. So if you look at, the Newark mounds in Newark, Ohio, which actually is about to become a UNESCO world heritage site, which is awesome. It's a great site. Um, the way that the site is laid out is, um, it lines up with the, um, what is it? It's the lunar, it's the lunar maximum moon rise. It only happens every like 16 years or something, but on that maximum, it basically comes up like, right where all these mounds are pointing there's like almost like this path that they all channel to and that's where the moon comes right up so Mm. so yeah i mean so there's a long tradition of this symbolic mound building and perhaps mm -hmm. for presiding over or putting elevating your ruling class or Mm -hmm. your priest class and you think that kohoki was sort of the the culmination of this tradition to some extent yeah in some ways i think it could kind of i don't know if i would say culmination but certainly like it's like most vibrant expression of it Mm -hmm. because i mean if you look at places like poverty point i mean they're like you know the main mound of poverty point is huge like it's the second biggest one in north america and that was built like you know that was built um like 3000 bc it's like you know it's a 5000 year old mound where's that so uh poverty point louisiana louisiana Mm-hmm. Yeah. Why do you? Kahoki was pretty late in the game, right? Mm-hmm. What do you think? Do you think that it just took a long time until people started to want to to concentrate like that? Um, that's a good question. I think it's a lot of things coming together at like the right place in the right time. I mean, think about it this way: if you have like a small settlement of people 
if you want them to, if, you know, if you want to get them to do anything, you have to, you know, you have to have a way to like motivate them to like, you know, build a mound or like build this grand new city. And then you have to have a way to like attract new people and to get them on board with the plan. And that's really, really hard to do, you know, especially, you know, like, especially like, you know, if you're like not using an army and like enslaving everybody, like it's really hard to do. You have to find a way to like scratch everybody's back and to make them happy. You have to offer them something to motivate them. And it's interesting because at Cahokia, you actually find um, there's evidence of like feasting. Like they have found like ditches where there's just tons of food waste, like, you know, like deer, maize, tobacco, you know, everybody's having a good time. And the, you know, the idea, and we can all tell that like all this food waste came from like one occasion, you know what I mean? It's not like there's layers. It's all from like the same moment. And the idea behind it is like, you know, people are coming in and building these mounds and they're getting a huge party thrown for them. You know, like, you come here, we're going to do this, and then we're just going to throw a massive, like, party and celebration at the end of it. You know? So, I think it's, like, a lot of things coming together. You need, like, the right leaders who can kind of make that happen. You need to have the ability for that many people to live in that area, so you need something like corn agriculture to feed all of them. Um, and then you need to be located at the right spot, which, if you're on the Mississippi, it's very easy to get people in and out of that spot, you know, probably wouldn't have happened if you're in the middle of Kansas. No offense. <laughs> and so what happens after Cahokia falls apart? Um, everybody basically disperses. You know, you find um, other settle, you know, you find other Mississippian settlements in the wake of Cahokia, like, um, you know, throughout the uh, uh, throughout the eastern woodland. Um, you know, some people go, you know, some people go west, some people go east. Um, a famous site that kind of go that kind of happens in the wake of Cahokia is um Spyro, Spyro Mounds in Oklahoma. Um, like that's another big site that um that emerges in the wake of Cahokia. I'm trying to think of some others, but but it seems like there just know. wasn't a ton of Etowah time. Is it, oh, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Oh, I was gonna say, like Etowa Mounds is like another one in Georgia. And that's also another pretty big mound site as well. But it seems like there wasn't too much time for a giant civil another similar scale. Let's call it like a city state. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To rise because the the Europeans showed up within like a few hundred years of Cahokia's decline, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there were still like some, you know, there were still some very impressive cities that got built there just none of them got as big as Cahokia you know I think I don't know I just people didn't want to live in cities that big anymore you know and it's interesting because yeah. some of those um some of the people that were probably in Cahokia probably like just abandoned that entire way of life for good there's some pretty compelling reasons to believe that um, among the people at Cahokia back then were Suin people, Suin people who later are known because they're living on the Great Plains, you know? And so in that case, it's interesting because, you know, their histories talk about them, you know, like moving west and then, you know, moving on to the plains and stuff. So like in their case, they almost completely give up, you know, some of them completely give up agriculture and they just survive on the plains others they keep it you know they keep some agriculture but they're still adapting to a new lifestyle it's really really interesting you know we tend to think of like uh, you know we tend to think of people being much less adaptive than they really are um you know if something collapses or something doesn't work people can just you know they'll figure out something that does even if it means radically changing how they live yeah that's definitely true uh oh go ahead you're gonna ask no no i, I have a different topic for you i think i i, I kind of want to pivot as well i was gonna ask about writing mm -hmm. what are you gonna ask about go ahead yeah what fraction of the cultures that you've studied in the americas had writing systems that we know of um that we know of yeah so 
you so writing currently is only known in Mesoamerica and you have I'm trying to remember how many different kinds of scripts there are I'm like trying to count them in my hand there's like five or six scripts that I can think of off the top of my head but again that's not a perfect number because some people you know some cultures may have used the same script as well so how you would split them through space and time I'm not sure but basically I would say like um several cultures in Mesoamerica would have had writing would have been literate in South America I'm not aware of any like pre-Columbian writing that's there unless you want to count quipus which are basically like records of knots that the Inca and the Wari used but again there is you know it's a whole debate about whether or not that constitutes writing and academics like argue about it for days they usually dry terms it's a debate that is just not fun to read in my opinion and then again in north america i'm not aware of any writing systems north of mesoamerica occasionally you might hear somebody claim that like the mississippians had like proto writing or picture writing i personally think that that evidence is kind of slim unless we can find more examples of it um because how do you you accomplish allocation of scarce resources to muster an agricultural workforce or have a standing army without writing it's it's like how do you make sure everybody gets paid and everybody gets the resources they need and it seems very difficult to pull off without writing but then like you mentioned the quipus like maybe there's alternative ways of record keeping that we're just Mm -hmm. blind to or oral i would oral means perhaps pictorial means so it's funny you mentioned this was like I wondered this too and I've never really read into it but I have but I've always thought like you know maybe like a lot of these records were public knowledge like when an agreement is reached you have to like make that agreement in public there have to be witnesses so everybody can say yes you agreed to this you agreed to that and if you don't honor that there are consequences you know that's what I mean on I mean you can't get you in that system, I think you would have to keep things, you know, simple. You couldn't get super complicated with them. At least I don't think. But, you know, maybe people found, you know, found ways around that. I, I really don't know. It's one of those things that just, you know, it doesn't survive. Is there tattoo culture in North America? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Is the, Yeah. My immediate mm-hmm. thought would be, like, if you make an agreement, then it gets recorded in a tattoo. And that way it's on your body um, indelibly. I mean, that makes sense. I don't know for sure if that was ever practiced like that. Maybe it was. I know in like the Northeast, like the Haudenosaunee or like the Iroquois, like that, like they had like tattoos that had specific meaning attached to them. Um, But yeah, I don't know if it was ever used yet to like seal agreements or like contracts or like obligations or anything that's a really interesting idea what are you gonna ask you're gonna pivot I mean, us yeah i guess i guess a, my biggest question is something like what are the outstanding mysteries in the research about the ancient americas what are mm-hmm. what are the places that people are really pouring attention into that that don't have resolutions or that don't make sense have you come across anything like that um well like i said earlier the maya collapse is like you know there's endless debate about that there's practically a little cottage industry around like you know writing you know your professional opinion about that the biggest one is probably how and when humans got into the americas i would say that is probably the biggest one right now because and it's been controversial since you know for like a hundred years now you know nobody you know nobody's ever agreed on it completely um i'm trying to think of some other big ones that are coming to mind yeah those are the big ones that stand out 
it, it relieves me that the peopling of the Americas and the timing of that arrival is so up for grabs still, because I feel like even after mm -hmm. having a, some conversations on this and looking into it, I have a very fuzzy picture of the order of events. Like you mentioned at yeah. some point that like, did people show up before the land bridge closed and then survive the closing of the land bridge and then others that's, came in? That's a possibility. It is not yet proven is how what's, I would put it. What's the, what's the evidence for that? So, um, so genetic, there right? is, mm -hmm. hmm? oh, you were saying it was genetic earlier, right? From what I could recall. It might be. Cause yeah, there, the population, why, like I said, it could represent a, um, like a very early migration. Most archeologists don't think that. So, you know, like asterisks take it with a, like a big grain of salt, but it is possible um, there are some archaeological sites like Chiquahita Cave in Mexico supposedly has, you know, dates that go back like 30,000 years. Um, again, the evidence is kind of circumstantial. People think that like, you know, again, they don't disagree with the dates. They just think that the artifacts aren't being interpreted correctly. There are recently there were um, like giant sloth bones that were found in South America that have like holes drilled through them. So somebody had to have like drilled a hole, presumably to like string that through something. And those date back to like, what was it? It was like, I think like 30 or 40,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. So if those are human made, like, you know, people could have been in here really early, you know? And like I said, it's entirely possible. It's just that, you know, you're looking for a needle in a haystack. I mean, those initial populations may have been, pretty small and very geographically spread out. And so just, you know, finding evidence of them isn't easy or it's possible that they came into the Americas and then eventually just, you know, died out or something, you know, and they've mm -hmm. left, like, they just haven't left a lot of evidence or have left no genetic lineages that are alive today, which like that does happen. Like we do have, you know, DNA of ancient people where we can look at it and say, these people don't have any descendants that we know of today. Like they never passed on their genetic material, or at least if they did, we haven't found it. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. It's, it's just amazing that people would even want to move into some of these regions. Like the will to move forward is really fascinating. I think that's what grabs people about the peopling. It's mm -hmm. like what drags, what, what makes you want to leave everything you know and press, like, there's something human about that. You see it in space exploration today. It's like there's this will to always find some, the next, you know, the grass is always greener kind of motif that plays out over and over and seems to have pushed people all the way down. But why did it happen so late? It's just so interesting. And you want to learn about it so you can figure out the lessons. Because if somebody did show up and it was a dead end, there's something mm -hmm. there that you want to figure out of like, well, what mistakes did they make? And maybe we can yeah. prevent those same mistakes from taking us down. Because you said so, so easily, like all cultures end. But it's like, mm -hmm. yes, but what about ours? Like, don't we want to, don't we want to keep parts of it and preserve it and figure out what, what is worth carrying over to the next mm -hmm. generations? And so there's yeah. a sense that, okay, well, if we study this and we can figure out what breaks a culture. Mm -hmm. perhaps we can grow something out of our culture that survives whatever break is coming. So people don't stop working at the grocery stores. I mean, I, no, <laughs> no, I think that it's like, how do you build something that survives people stopping to work at the grocery store? Because I'm like, the cities could just empty out. The, 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 the chains could collapse. It could break. But that's civilization. That's not culture. Mm-hmm. And so I'm like, what do we, what do we maintain, and what do we carry, and how can we trace that? Is kind of an eternally interesting question. That is a yeah, that is a really interesting question. I mean, you know, the cultures, you know, they come and go, but like the humans survive, like they do go on. I mean, you know, like when the Roman Empire fell, it's not like every Roman just died. I mean, they kept living. You know, they just became. You know, they became like. Venetians, Florentines, Sicilians, and then they eventually became Italians and stuff. And like, you know, in the Americas, it's the same way, you know, a culture or like a city or something gets abandoned, but you know, like 
those people survive. Like, you know, they, they go on, they persist. If anything, like, I realize that now that I'm like thinking about it, I realize that like my words earlier probably sounded a bit pessimistic, but in a lot of ways, I think like there's an optimism to it because, you know, because humanity goes on at the end of the day, you know, if there's like some catastrophe, be it political, be it environmental or something like people persist, they keep going on, you know, people are resilient. And there must be some momentum to that and some pride in that, hey, look at what we're doing. We didn't, we don't need that city, you know, and after a few generations, it's just, you get used to it. Maybe that's why mm-hmm. there's these gaps between the appearances. I mean, in the old world, it's insane, like 7,000 year gap between the oldest cities and the Mesopotamian cities. I just think we haven't found the pieces maybe, that fill maybe. the gap. Yeah. You know, it's like, maybe, but it's... like, I think there's something to people also just getting sick of it too. And just being like that. Well, that was a failed experiment, you know. <laughs> oh, you, we were listening. Um, you know the Fall of Civilizations podcast. Yes, I am familiar with them. Mm-hmm. He did a really interesting one on the Nabataeans, who were the ah. ones that lived in Persia. And so they were living in Petra. Not in Persia. That's I think right. it was yes. in like it was. Uh, it's in Jordan. It, it, in Jordan, not in Persia. But, sorry, sorry, yeah. sorry. Yeah. But you you read more about this later, but it seems like the culture was kind of just, hey, leave us alone. Like we're not we're not interested in this like empire building. We're not interested mm-hmm. yeah, they're in They're very in proud conquering. of that. I think they thought of it as their their safety line was that we don't have anything you guys would want, essentially. So you leave yeah. us alone. We're just doing our own thing. <laughs> just doing our own thing. And there's some safety to that, I imagine. But mm-hmm. like, and, and it's just when you look at those gaps between the civilizations or the you know, the big massive cultures. You think, well, maybe it wasn't because they didn't know how to do it. They just didn't want to do it. Yeah, it's true. Mm-hmm. It's a very specific impulse. I uh, mean, like you said earlier, you know, why does anybody why does anybody migrate? You know, why wouldn't you just stay in the same area that you grew up in? You know, people are gonna move out for one reason or another and seek out, you know, seek out their futures somewhere else. Yeah, and there, I think that you're right that there's there's an optimism to it, which is that we live right now in a time where I think people are really preoccupied with this question of, okay, well, what's going to happen? It seems really precarious. And we have all this evidence of things that fall apart for people. But I think that the hope is truly that the human spirit never ceases. Mm-hmm. And yeah, so like people also- find a way regardless of whether their state fails them or not. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> and the state will fail. <laughs> I was about to say, it might get ugly, but yeah, you know, there will still be humans on planet Earth, you know, if it all goes to hell or whatever. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, man, it's been really, this has been really interesting. Yeah, who would you recommend that we talk to to continue this That's line of investigation? Like, who are wow. some of the cool names? I know you mentioned, can you, can you remind me of who the author of that book is that you were reading recently? But Jennifer maybe, Raff. Oh, okay, Jennifer. Yeah, Jennifer Raff. Um, yeah, she's a genetics professor at University of Kansas, if I recall. Um, trying to think who else. Um, there is, so an archaeologist that has a channel that I really like is... Um, Ed Barnhart, um, he does the YouTube channel slash podcast, um, Archeo Ed, um, might reach out to him. And then I think I mentioned this person recently, um, when we last spoke, but Nate Fossane, you know, he also has an archeology span channel and he's an actual archeologist. Um, he mainly specializes in like Eastern woodlands and stuff. Um, Dr. Ed, his experience, I think, is mainly focused on Mesoamerica, but he's like got experience in like some other areas as well too. Um, cool. But yeah, those are all that I can think of right now. Um, I mean, honestly, you know, you pick up a good book and really like reading it. You know, you can always reach out to the author. <laughs> That's definitely true. Where can people find most of your work? Oh, they can just find me on YouTube. Channel name is just Ancient Americas. And then I know that there are episodes that, you know, you can just search by popular episodes, but the popular episodes are not always the ones that are the favorites of the creators. And so if somebody was going to come to your channel, which videos do you suggest they start with? That is a good, hold on, let me pull up. Because you've made so much stuff. You have such a library. pull up my videos really quick. I mean, honestly, there, I will say this, there is not 
a single episode where I would say like, don't watch that episode. It's bad. It's terrible. Um, Cause if I felt that way, I would just delist the episode, but there are ones that are, that I like more than others. Um, oh man. Yeah. It's hard to single these out. The, okay. So one episode, one episode that I really, really, really loved making was the Dorset culture episode, which is basically about like the people that were in the North American Arctic before the Inuit migrated from Siberia in there. I knew zero about the topic before I did that. And like doing all the researching and writing for that was just like an amazing adventure. I learned so much. I had my mind blown so many times. I really liked that episode and it's not particularly, it's not one of my most popular, but I really liked that one. Um, let me think here. Another one that I really like that, again, isn't very popular is I did a basically a biographical episode on Nezawak Coyote, who is who was the king of Teshkoko. He was one of the founding members of the Triple Alliance. Um, his story is really fascinating for a lot of reasons. And again, like I don't do many biographies. In fact, I think that's the only biographical episode I've done, and I really enjoyed that one because it was very, very different. Um, yeah, I don't know. Like, I mean, they're 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 all good episodes. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Yeah, I agree. Or at least yeah, all of them I've bad. seen. Agree. Let me put it this way: none of them are bad. <laughs> yeah, I like the way that you take a lot of information and make it into a single story that's easy to remember and digest. They're they're very. Um, I just feel like there's so much information yeah. for each for each episode that could be in they're there. Very simple. Yeah, you do a really good, good job of keeping it to the to a narrative that is effective, streamlined. Yeah, because like oftentimes you can just like it, I think that it's possible when you start to write something to just put down everything that you know, and mm -hmm. like it's clear that you really curate it super carefully. And so I really appreciate that. Well, I've gotten, I was about to say, at this point, I've had a lot of practice at it. It's it's funny. I have one of my friends um, is a writer. And every time like I finish a draft, I basically hand it to him. He reads it and he doesn't like he's like not a history buff. He doesn't know anything about pre-Columbian Americas, which is awesome because it's like if he understands it, if it all makes sense to him then it's probably a good script. He's very good at being like, this doesn't make sense or like you need to explain this better so yeah having somebody who's completely unfamiliar with your topic check your work is very valuable and he's told me before like you've gotten like really good at like anticipating like what needs to be in the script and like what shouldn't be in there yeah it's really it's really apparent that's a good friend to have for sure mm -hmm. too yeah man let's catch up again down the line Thank yeah you. definitely anytime it was really good having you yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing what, what comes out of your channel next. And, and yeah, thanks for yeah. Giving us the time. <laughs> yeah, next video should be coming uh, January because December I always take really slow. It's usually when I like to catch up and spend time with people. And then, yeah, January we'll be back at the grindstone. Nice. All right. Well, we look forward to that. All right. Thank you yeah, so thanks much. Thanks for coming right. by. All right. Bye bye. All right, take bye, care. Everybody. Bye, everybody.